This is the College of Complexes. And since we're missing our usual compliment of students, I want you to go out there and compel them to come in. And remember that we have rules here. And the first rule is one fool at a time. And the second is that we do not insult anyone here personally or their mothers. And uh, beyond that, we're pretty free with our, our rules. <laughs> I heard we had a speaker tonight, Brom. Uh, yes, we do have a speaker tonight. <laughs> and his name is Lawrence. But this is not just Lawrence. It's Mr. Lawrence. 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 Richard Lawrence. Okay, and without any further ado, we will hear about American Future Foundation from him. Thank you very much, and uh, I will be your first fool of this evening, probably not your last. <laughs> uh, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for having me here this evening and making me feel so welcome, uh, Brom and, and Tim and Charlie in particular. It's funny, I met Charlie probably last July at Bug House Square. Yeah. <laughs> when I was uh, in the main debate with a member of the Chicago Teachers Union on uh, collective bargaining in the public sector. And uh, we thought that went fairly well. We had a fairly antagonistic crowd, but uh, my position on that, uh, as you might or might not expect from reading uh, my description on your flyers, is that public sector, uh, that collective bargaining is actually not compatible with, uh, with uh, public sector uh, unionization. So we can talk about that later uh, if that's something that each of you uh, would like to delve into. But let me introduce myself by telling you who I'm representing here this evening. Uh, I'm not representing the Ron Paul uh, candidacy for president, although I've got the sticker on my, on my shirt. I was at an event earlier today. Again, another fruitful topic I think we could probably talk about. Who here knows about Ron Paul? Who here is a fan of Ron Paul? Who here hates Ron Paul? <laughs> awesome. A wonderful, a wonderful, another topic for conversation later on. And I can answer your question, why should you hate Ron Paul? I'll probably describe why you should love Ron Paul. Uh, but I'm going to take this off uh, because that's not my name. My name is Richard Lawrence, and I am uh, with a group called America's Future Foundation. It's my volunteer job. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Chicago chapter, and I have been for the past three years. What we do at America's Future Foundation, which we show to AFF, is we identify, develop, and teach the next generation of classical liberal leaders. That's actually a term that's gone out of fashion lately. But classical liberal basically means uh, sort of the John Stuart Mill, Adam Smith type of liberal. It's the way that they use the word liberal in Europe today still. If you say that you're a liberal in Europe, uh, you're probably describing that you're an advocate of, of a free market economy, uh, individual liberty, uh, constitutional re or representative government, a limited government that has its powers prescribed by some sort of uh, uh, restriction. Um, so we recruit the next generation of these classical liberal leaders. These are people who have uh, graduated from college recently all the way up to uh, sort of the midpoint in their career around 40 years old. So we have events on a regular basis in River North uh, in this city. <clears throat> in fact, we had one uh, this past Wednesday. It was our debate of Palooza. And at our debate of Palooza, we answered three questions. Is income inequality unjust? I'm sure a very interesting question for all of us. Does the presidential race actually matter? Does it really matter with the $6 billion that we're going to spend on electing a president this year? And our last question was, is Ron Paul's foreign policy dangerous? A lot of Republicans think that pulling out from uh, uh, the world and uh, not intervening in other countries' internal affairs and being more uh, judicious about the way in which we use military force around the world. A lot of Republicans believe that that Ron Paul's foreign policy is dangerous, even though it is, again, something similar to a classical liberal type of uh, foreign policy, especially for a republic and not a 
Ottoman Empire. And so we talked about uh, those three things in this past uh, debate. But we have events every month downtown in River North. We usually get crowds of about 40 to 50 people to talk about ideas. And that's kind of the topic that I wanted to discuss with you this evening. I think, you know, another way to describe the College of Complexes would probably be to say the College of Many Ideas. You like to discuss uh, philosophy. It sounds like there's an opportunity for archaeology coming up here. Uh, the Bronze Age in, in ancient Turkey, which sounds very interesting. Uh, I would attend that. Um, but we like to talk about ideas, and the ideas that we like to talk about at AFF uh, most of the time are those relating to economics and civil society. And uh, I'm sure those are terms that you've heard before. Economics, we, we tend to uh, focus on the Austrian school and the Chicago school, both different uh, schools of, of free market economics. Of course, Milton Friedman, one of the most famous proponents of the Chicago school, uh, an advocate of monetary theory down at the University of Chicago, and then the Austrian School, which is much more critical of monetary theory and, and much more along the lines of analyzing the purposes and the causes of the business cycle. Um, so we talk about economics. We also talk about civil society, and civil society are uh, all those many institutions that we have, formal and informal, that create the society in which we live. One of my favorite philosophers and, and economists is a gentleman by the name of Friedrich Hayek. Who has heard of Hayek here? Very good. This is, and that's not Selma Hayek, so we're, uh, we're going well. We're, we're, we have uh, a good number of people here who know where I'm talking about. Because if you Google Hayek, you're probably going to see pictures of a beautiful woman, but uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, that's right. So Friedrich Hayek, F.A. Hayek, was at the London School of Economics around the time that uh, John Maynard Keynes was. And they had a long-running debate about the business cycle, about intervention in the economy, about uh, how uh, uh, fiscal policy can potentially stimulate an economy. And so uh, one of my favorite, Friedrich Hayek is one of my favorite economic philosophers and political philosophers. And one of the things he talked about um, in many of his um, uh, books and writings was the separation and the difference between organizations and society. Whereas organizations are things that you join freely, like the College of Complexes or America's Future Foundation or the Republican Party or the Democrat Party or the, Com the Communist Party. Those are things that you uh, choose by virtue of value or uh, sometimes coercion in the case of a um, uh, uh, labor union. If you can't, if you have to ch take a job and join a labor union, that is not a very voluntary way to join an organization. But that would be an example of an organization. So organizations exist, and they they, are, they compose one part of a civil society. But then you have society as a whole, and that's a more organic thing that that uh, emerges from the various different organizations that are present within a society. And what Hayek said was, it's very interesting to try to think of a government falling into either one of these buckets, whether it's um, organizations or society, because what government is is something that you were born into. You don't have a choice. If you live in a country, a nation state, you have uh, the responsibility uh, of fulfilling your duties as a citizen. You also have rights under that framework. But the government is a very interesting thing, because it's an organization that you join, and it's sort of grafted on top of society. And so it's not only an organization, but it's also society. So it's a very uh, uh, interesting type of way to, to parse that, uh, the two different things. So we talk about Hayek. We also talk about other people. Have, has anyone here, heard here of uh, Friedrich Bastiat, a French philosopher? Very nice. Friedrich Bastiat, one of his most uh, uh, well-known books is called The Law. And in The Law, he talked about a number of issues. One of them was... Uh, he talked about free market issues in a way that sort of a, the common person could understand. He talked about it in a story type of way. And so one of the stories was um, uh, if, if the candle maker were to petition the government to block out the sun for a subsidy for candle makers, would that make sense? That's what we have all the time with people who petition the government to give them special consideration of tax money or of law or of uh, uh, tax breaks, whatever it is. Any type of consideration that goes above and beyond what a person would normally be afforded under the standard rule of law, he challenged that idea. And he said, 
it's the very same thing as if the candle maker would petition the government to, to, uh, to block out the sun so he would have more business. So he talked about things in a free market, in a civil society, and, and in terms of the rule of law, in a very down-to-earth fashion. And if anyone here hasn't read The Law by Bastiat or any of his other works, I recommend it highly. Another person who we talk about often um, is a gentleman named uh, Ludwig von Mises. And who here has heard of Mises? I'm seeing similar hands uh, be raised for, for all these people in the, the common bucket of uh, M-I-S-E-S, -E and he was an Austrian uh, economist and philosopher. In fact, he was the mentor for uh, Friedrich Hayek, who I mentioned earlier. And Mises wrote a wonderful book, and we talk about this a lot of the, at the AFF events. And his book, uh, his magnum opus, was called Human Action. And in Human Action, he talked about a notion <clears throat> which he titled Praxeology. And Praxeology is the science and study of human action. Basically, uh, praxeology is um, the will in the mind is expressed as action through the hand. So, <clears throat> what he was talking about is much deeper than price systems or uh, subsidies or any of these other notions that we're talking about, but basically a way to think about the way in which people behave in society and people behave themselves. So we like to talk about these sorts of ideas at AFF. Um, because, uh, and, and we like to talk about it outside of the framework in which you're going to have many of these ideas presented to you during the day. Uh, if you turn on the evening news, of course, uh, you're going to be given an opportunity to choose between red and blue, Republican and Democrat, uh, conservative or liberal. It's a polemic that we've created for ourselves and we've been able to put ourselves into those boxes. And sometimes people are so attached to the particular team in which they've, to which they've identified themselves that they, can re they, they don't open their minds to other ideas. So we try to avoid the partisan side of this and talk about ideas generally. In fact, one of my favorite ideas that I like to uh, sort of bring up in these sorts of discussions is uh, it's a Stoic idea. And it's the way in which the, Stoa, the Stoics actually were deliberate in their thought and how they considered things that were being presented to them and how they processed that over time. And there are four simple hand gestures that the Stoics used to demonstrate how they would recommend people incorporate new ideas into their way of thinking. And it goes like this. First is the impression. You're presented with uh, something new that you see or hear or smell. Immediately, you have an impression. It's an outstretched hand with your fingers out. This is something that you're looking, you're receiving more. You're taking it in. This is the very first step to knowledge, but it's not the last step. The next step is the opinion. After you've spent a little bit of time with that impression, you might have had the opportunity to talk about it with other people or think about it a little bit more. Maybe you were in the shower and you had a eureka moment and you formed an opinion on this new thing that you were presented uh, only a day or two ago as far as an impression goes. And that's sort of a closed hand. It's not a, it's not a clenched fist, but it's, it's closed from the impression. So you, you begin with an impression, you then move to opinion, and then you have the clenched fist. And that is a conviction. The Stoics believe you can only achieve conviction after a lot of thought, after a lot of deliberation, after you've had this idea and the impression and the opinion challenged over time. And this is this is probably as far as most people are going to get in their lives to achieving knowledge. Because to the Stoics, knowledge wasn't to be created, it was to be discovered. It existed. So the conviction was the third step to achieving knowledge, and then knowledge was last. And knowledge is a clenched fist held by your other hand. And so you have an impression, which you always begin with, your opinion, conviction, and then knowledge. And that's helpful to me when I'm presented with something new. And that's sort of how we, we try to consider new ideas that we are presented with at America's Future Foundation. I neglected to mention that America's Future Foundation has been around for 15 years. I, I mentioned before that I'm a volunteer and our entire leadership in Chicago is volunteer based. We have eight members of uh, the young professional community on our, on our committee here in town. But we also have chapters in Washington, D.C. We have one in Denver, Minneapolis. I'm beginning one in Atlanta. 
We're beginning one in Raleigh. We have one in Pittsburgh. And we have one uh, in uh, Nashville and New York City. New York City. I was in New York City this past November for the launch of our chapter there. We had New York, uh, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal columnist who just won the Pulitzer Prize. His name is Joe Rago. He appeared at our opening uh, party for America's Future Foundation in New York. So we have a nationwide movement of young professionals who identify themselves by many stripes. Classical liberal, libertarian, conservative, anarchist, anarcho-capitalist. A lot of people who are curious about the ideas that we're presenting and might identify themselves as leftist or socialist. And we're happy to talk with them as well. Our main goal is to expose people to the ideas of those, of those individuals who I mentioned before, Hayek. Bastia, Mises, Friedman is another one, and to begin discussion with them on certain topics uh, uh, relating to current events. I figured after giving a brief overview of what we do at AFF, uh, we'd probably just open up the floor to questions. I'm happy to talk about anything I was just discussing before, uh, Ron Paul, uh, any sort of temporal idea or uh, uh, philosophical I'm very interested in mythology. If you've ever read anything in terms of mythology and anything by Joe Campbell, Joe Campbell is a fantastic uh, student of comparative mythology and religions. It plays very well into these ideas that we were talking about before. So I'm going to open up the floor to questions, and we can kind of take it from there. Yes, Tim. All right. If you were to extrapolate what's going to be happening in the next 15 years, as you said, you are the young future foundation. <coughs> What would those events be, and what is your rationale behind them? You know, Tim, if I had an idea of what, what the next 15 years would look like, I probably would be uh, a lot richer than I am right now. Uh, you know, I don't know. The trajectory of the country is very interesting, and I think it kind of comes into uh, the dissatisfaction a lot of people my age and a little bit younger are feeling with their decision to support President Obama by a margin of 67% last election in 2008. Um, I think people are disenchanted by that, and I think that they're uh, gravitating toward people who are talking about ideas rather than temporary policies. And I think that's why one of the reasons that Ron Paul is so successful now. I wrote an article yesterday uh, that got a fair bit of uh, circulation online, and it was basically saying that Ron Paul is not going to win the presidential election. Let's not be deluding ourselves. Let's not think that uh, that's going to happen. But he is changing the tenor of politics. Instead of being one of the people up on the stage currently who's talking about, uh, you know, whether they've invested in Fannie or Freddie uh, through their trust funds or uh, whether they're on their third wife or their fourth wife <laughs> or, you know, whatever other question that people in the salacious uh, sense of the media like to, like to pursue, he's not interested in those sorts of things. And I don't think a lot of people my age are. And I think the tenor of politics is changing such that um, it's going to be difficult for uh, people to simply repeat sound uh, a talking points very easily. You have to be talking about deeper ideas. And the idea that I think a lot of people are gravitating toward who are my age uh, it is liberty. And that's a, that's a difficult word because a lot of people define liberty in a lot of different ways. The way that I define liberty and the way that I believe that Ron Paul defines liberty is liberty in your economic behavior and, and, and what you can do economically, and that namely means a free market, um, and also in, in your individual sphere. Um, it's a very difficult thing for a lot of Republicans to uh, grant economic liberty, or at least say that they're for that, even though we know that they've not behaved that way in recent years. But then to come back around and say, well, you know, liberty in one sphere is okay, but it's not in the other sphere. I think, you know, that's a very empowering thing for young people particularly. You know, there's the rebellious streak that young people have. But it also makes sense um, in terms of uh, the best of all possible worlds. And so we, don't, we won't be able to have utopia. A lot of people believe libertarianism means that we're aiming toward everyone having unicorns and butterflies and being happy. And, and that's how it's going to turn out. That's, that's exactly the opposite. What we have with free market economy and what we have with, with libertarianism and allowing people to exercise the maximum amount of freedom as long as they don't impugn others is a system that is um, not perfect. 
but it allows us to take care of the, the uh, least fortunate among us and then ourselves as well. Yes? Um, yeah, uh, you keep talking about free markets. Yes, sir. Do you think, can you think of an example of one where one has ever existed? Um, so a lot of libertarians tend to say, let's go back to 1776. It was perfect back then, you know, the halcyon days of, of that. Yeah, right. And that's, uh, that's, that's both. Um, you know, I would say uh, 18th century and 19th century Britain, when they started, uh, they lifted all protectionist tariffs. And it was actually the age of piracy also. But that was very good for the British economy. You had this, this flourishing of small businesses, of merchants, of small business owners that occurred around the same time as what Deirdre McCloskey down at UIC calls uh, the bourgeois re revolution. These bourgeois values of creating value and profiting off of creating value for others started to be accepted socially. It was suddenly okay in 18th century Britain, for example, for you to be a merchant and to make a profit off of selling something to someone else. It was no longer frowned down upon. And so we were never at a perfect free market. Another example, but that would be, probably be the closest, and that was an age of prosperity for Britain unrivaled in its own history, in European history, and it set off uh, quite a bit of prosperity in the rest of the Western world at that point. Another example, the Polish-Lithuanian Republic uh, from the 15th century to the, uh, seven, uh, to the 18th century was um, a haven for trade. Um, the Silk Road, another example of that. So we haven't, there's been no nation state since the Treaty of, of Westphalia which said that nations should be able to form their own sovereign states. I'm not entirely sure I could claim beyond Britain that there has been that. But when you had uh, uh, sort of the old world economies of 14th, probably to the 17th and 18th century, you had a fair bit of free trade. Because if I were to, I tell people this often, if I were to classify myself as something other than a liberal, and by that I mean a classical liberal, I would, I would describe my political views in a single word, and that's trade. Trade between, between individuals, ideas and goods. Mm -hmm. Trade between nations, um, the same way. Um, it is the only way to achieve progress. In fact, there's a fantastic book that I recommend all of you read. It's by a gentleman named Matt Ridley. It's a couple of years old. It's called The Rational Optimist. And in the book he says, the only way for humankind to progress is if ideas have sex. I love that. And ideas have sex if they're traded, right? So progress occurs when ideas have sex. And, and, and so, again, not a perfect example of a free market economy. We're, we're pushing toward that. But we've seen in the past that it works, and we see in our own behavior that it works between people in our own communities. Real quick follow-up. Are you, do you think you're describing free markets, or are you describing open markets? Because there is a distinction. Make the distinction. I'm not sure if I know the distinction. Okay, a free market is where um, it's like completely unregulated, and it just evolves sort of on its own. An open market is one where um, there's a deliberate attempt to make it to where everybody has an opportunity to participate and become involved and, and flourish in it. I think they're synonyms. Um, and so in a free market, let's not mistake ourselves. I'm not saying, and I don't think anyone who's promoting a free market economy is saying, let's get rid of all the regulations, let's have no laws. We still need property rights to be enforced. We still need contracts to be enforced. We still need people to adjudicate on the, the disputes that are going to, going to occur between people. Um, we need regulation. But regulation not in the sense that we need more rules to govern the way in which people behave, but regulation to... to uh, ensure that trade happens on a regular basis. Again, contracts are enforced. Property rights are enforced. An open and a free market, I, I don't discern between the two because I would describe a free market in both the way that you describe your free market and open market. It's not getting rid of all the regulations. It's using regulations that work and there are a whole other conversation to come from that. Yes? Sir. In, um Right now we have a situation where we are losing civil liberties by the day. How can we talk about economic liberty without first establishing a firm basis and reestablishing our civil liberties? It's a great question. Um, I don't see them as separate. I see if you have civil liberty, you must also have, econ have economic liberty. I don't see them as uh, 
it, it would be inconsistent to say that we can grant you civil liberties but not economic liberties. Uh, that's what the Chinese are trying to do now. They're trying to say that you can have the fruits of, of uh, the world through global trade, but that you can't participate in your own uh, governance. It's not going to last for long. I see them as inseparable. And I do agree with you, with the TSA, with the drug war, even with the way in which the public school system is organized now. All of those are violations of civil liberties, but it's general liberty. All of it works together. You can't have civil liberty without economic liberty and vice versa. Okay. Yes, sir. What is your feeling of uh, government regulation in areas, say, of uh, safety? Um, that is the type of regulation that would be entirely acceptable in the free market. Free market uh, economics accepts that entirely. Yes, ma'am. In the current situation, what are the units of trade during the uh, local corporation? Do you mean in terms of currency? Units of trade. I'm wondering what units of trade. Would you repeat the question, please, so we can get it? But could you repeat the whole question, and I'll repeat it in the microphone. Okay. Tether the mic. I won't drop it. Okay. Just leave it on there. Just leave it on there. Okay. Who trades between who? So your question is, who are who is who's doing this global trade? We have international corporations. I mean, is that what you're talking about? If so, what does everyone else do? Well, how many people can be engaged? Only. They're individuals. That's what libertarian posits. Individuals are granted rights. Now, you're participating in global trade right now with that rosé. You could be getting it from California, or you might be getting it from, from Italy. You're an individual participating through other individuals in terms of corporations, which you're talking about, to participate in global trade. Individuals are the only ones who are granted rights. So if you are allowed by policy, uh, and that might bring up another question, Citizens United maybe? Uh, we'll talk about that later. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. The unit of, the person, the, 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 the actors in the trade are individuals. They could be individuals individually, or they could be individuals in groups. Either way, it's individuals. <laughs> Uh, just a, 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 a probing what you meant by a general dissatisfaction by your generation with Obama. You sure. mentioned some 67% of your age group uh, you know, voted for him, and now there's kind of a reversal. Can you, can you flush that out a little bit? I'm not sure it's entirely in reverse, but I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with, with the, the tropes that were given back in 08, hope and change. How much hope and change have we gotten? It's pretty much been managing the decline. We haven't really changed. We haven't gotten Freddie and Fannie out of the mortgage industry. The Federal Reserve continues to be printing money and causing inflation, which is bound to happen. Um, we have a growing bureaucracy that uh, 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 is is costing more and more money. I don't see. I, so we've had a couple of things. We have. Uh, civil uh, or, or, or gay people are allowed to claim benefits if their partner is a, a federal employee. That made a lot of people on the left very happy. Uh, we don't have Guantanamo closed. Uh, we have some troops being taken out of Iraq, but we have more troops in Afghanistan than were in before uh, Obama took office. And so I think a lot of people realize that uh, slogans are one thing, but where action comes, uh, this president has not performed as well as they would like. And, by the way, 25% of people in my age group are still unemployed. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, you know, a general dissatisfaction of malaise, I don't know. Maybe it's like it was in the late 70s. Uh, yes, sir. I'll tell you what, I've got to take a call, so uh, 
Take that call. Take someone else. Take someone else. Go with you, sir. Excluding Ron Paul and Dr. Pangloss. Yes. Is there a consensus among the yeah. Chicago chapter as to who they would vote for on the Republican primaries? Uh, I would say uh, the Chicago chapter is uh, its not partisan. We're not a Republican group, but a lot of people who come to our group uh, are uh, members of the Republican Party. It's about 50-50 Ron Paul Mitt Romney at this point. People like winners. No, I said excluding Ron Paul and Dr. Pangloss. Pangloss. Who is Pangloss? <laughs> Voltaire, uh, uh, yeah. Voltaire, Voltaire, the, the, the character of the doctor, the uh, 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 optimism. <coughs> yeah, so he's the optimist in Candide. Oh, okay. And so is that is that Mitt Romney? Yeah, it, it's <laughs> those two. Uh, is, is there a consensus in the Chicago chapter? Excluding those two? I don't think there's anything excluding those two. I think that's really what the, the people in the party... If, if I recall, you said uh, Ron Paul would not win. Uh, that's my personal belief, yes. yes. So Of the general election, yeah. In the general election. Uh, in the Republican primaries, is there a consensus among your group as to which of the candidates they would vote for? Even though I think that they that he wouldn't win, that doesn't pre uh, presume that people aren't going to vote for him. I would say it's 50-50, Mitt Romney, uh, Dr. Paul. Do you think economic sanctions are ever appropriate? For instance, if uh, we wanted to pressure Iran from backing down from the nuclear program, or if we chose not to do business with nations that used eight-year-olds to work 18-hour days to manufacture them. Do you think economic sanctions in cases like this are appropriate? You know, I, I, I don't, as a general rule, think that they are, because I think that they're aggressive by their very nature, and I think that they undercut the role that we uh, try to have in the world, which is uh, the moral leader. And if we're not able to transmit our, our moral goals peacefully through persuasion, through trade, through letting them know what we're about here in the United States and our culture, um, I don't think that we're going to be uh, more successful through the use of direct force. Okay, this is not direct, this follow, not direct force, but merely saying you're taking eight year old kids working 18 hours a day and paying them about three cents an hour, and we're going to choose to do business with you until you get your act together. You, you know, that, this is not justified. No, no, I think, I think that's an interesting question because I was thinking about that today. I'm a huge fan of Apple, and in the past uh, few days, especially. We've been seeing interesting reports uh, coming Watch out down. about some of their suppliers in China. Uh, one former Apple executive said that if people knew how their iPhone was made, uh, they wouldn't buy it because of similar situations that you've outlined. But what I've seen is something also very, very interesting, and I think this is exactly how it ought to operate in a free market. Maybe something we didn't have uh, 70 years ago or 80 years ago when we had children working here in the United States and, and the labor union began. What now, what now we have is excellent communication, and so what we're, we're able to see the message of eight-year-olds working in China has transmitted widely throughout the country, and people are making decisions based on, do I want to buy an iPhone now? Now that I know that this is a, a situation where people are standing up for 18 hours a day and their feet are getting swollen, and then you're seeing petitions. I get petitions through the email, and it says, if you don't believe that Apple should be employing these policies, sign on board. Go to change.org and, and sign the petition. We'll send it to Apple. We'll ask Apple. We'll tell Apple that we expect better from them. This is the choice that a consumer has to make in the free market. If you know the information that your product has been put together by uh, uh, eight-year-old kids who are being exploited, then you can make the choice not to, not to buy it. And that is an individual choice that you can make. You don't need anyone else to make that choice for you. You can make that choice by yourself, and you can communicate that to your friends and your neighbors and, and other people. That is how social pressure and social cleavage work so much more efficiently and better and have a moral standing over forceful government action. I'll say one more thing about that. There are a lot of people who work in, in what we call third world countries in sweatshops. And we used to have the idea of sweatshops here in the United States. In fact, Milton Friedman likes to talk about this in his Free to Choose series that we had uh, in New York City. He, his mother came from uh, Eastern Europe 
and uh, uh, was working in, in a, as, a, as a seamstress in New York City in a shop for 18 hours a day in the United States. And she did it, and she, and she was better off for it. Was she eight years old? I'm not saying eight-year-olds. Let's, let's table eight-year-olds for the moment. Let's table eight-year-olds for the moment. what? Better than not having a job. And that's oh, what I'm saying. Everything. Oh, I... Right. Right. Do you think that's so, a valid so ethical position? Let, let's talk for them. If they have the, if they're not being forced into the job, I do. I think if that's their choice, then they should. So, such a thing as so just punching you in the belly is better than shooting you. That makes punching you okay. No, that's still violence. Let's let's not. No, no. That's, you that's, say that's it's a better. straw man. That's a straw man argument. What I'm saying is that the people in Indonesia who work in these sweatshops for 18 hours a day, if they are doing it, well, let's posit that they are doing it of their own free will. Economic coercion aside, if it's done of their own free will, and those situations and circumstances look horrible to us, that's not for us to judge. It isn't? It is not. As because a, we're not in that situation. You, you, are, you have no ethics? As a corollary, what are you, ethics, a rock? I, I live Come in the United on, States. We all li we, we live in a very privileged place. You know that as well as anyone sure. else. I know right and wrong, pal. As a corollary, they make about six times more at the sweatshop than they do on the field where they're coming from originally. Yeah, if you're farm. making yes, yeah, you're farming wonderful. rice. One at a time. Uh, yeah. Can I get some more water here? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you wanted freedom, right? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with what you did in Chile? with what the United States, the CIA, undermined Salvador Allende and the consequences of that, that's a free market. It's not actually. It, it's not, it's, that's not a free market. But he claimed it was. He, Friedman claimed that it was. Yes, but he was, not, he, was not, he was not the person, Pinochet, who overran a democratically elected government. He advised a government on free market policies that they might be able to adopt. He was not running the CIA. That was no, American government. But they you completed the two services. They destroyed the pension system in Chile. Mm -hmm. People now are broke and led to destitution. Now you seem to have no concern for the person at the bottom, who who uh, they established. They're the ones who paid for the price of capitalism in your wanted England. Why should not? One of these people on the very bottom, what's wrong? Why should they not take a gun and go after people like you who are trying to drive them into poverty? Because I do. That's but not me. But your philosophy is doing that. The policy is right the wing, This right wing policy uh, is easy. 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 Yeah, Beef noodle. Good. And, uh, I'll be uh, I don't need to answer that. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Uh, how is ownership of the collectively operated <laughs> How is ownership of a collective the collectively operated means of production corporation? Uh, I don't know if you don't believe in unions. Uh, I believe in unions. Oh, well. They exist, don't they? We got one, we had one talked about before. Yeah, they exist. Uh, yeah. uh, and it's not that uh, <laughs> if uh, how is the is parallel? What constitute what body uh, constitutes that well, you did mention moral cleavage, which I'm not really sure uh, I, I, when I think of cleavage, I think of something else. <laughs> Uh, well, it's a question, Brian. I, I, I'm not sure exactly where you're going. Yeah. How is how is the ownership in a in a capitalist society determined? Is that what you're asking? Of a corporation. In a free society. Ownership of the commons is that what Are we talking about private ownership or commons? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Go into both types. How is ownership of the common? I mean, if it's collectively operated, it would be collectively owned by what kind of collectively? Certainly. How I think American that Airlines does that. Determined? How is it to be de determined? Yes. Under what 
conditions is it to be uh, under law? Uh, if you have law. Well, the actual, okay, so there, there are a couple things to unpack there. Uh, first of all, the word property, it wasn't used in its current term until probably 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago. If you were to read someone like John Stuart Mill and he was to talk to you about um, ownership of something, he would say you have property in something. I have property in this glass of water. Property then was synonymous with the term that we call now rights, okay? So property and rights, fairly similar uh, notions and, uh, and concepts to unpack there. So how are, how, is, how are property rights, I guess a conflation of those two terms, how are they assigned is what you're asking? How are they assigned and determined in a free society? You purchase property in something through something else of value, <laughs> which can either be currency, it can either be barter, it could be work. The people who are working at American Airlines who own their company, own stock in their company according to how long they've been working with that company. Other people own stock in American Airlines, own property in it by exchanging currency, which they have earned through other means to purchase it. And those property rights must be meet three conditions in a free society. Property rights must be defensible through a court system, meaning that if you are challenged over a property that you have, you must be able to defend it either through a title or a deed. They must be definable, which means you must be able to say, this is my glass, no others. And they must be divestible, which means in a free society, you have to be able to rid yourself of that in which you have property at any point. And so if property rights in a country, or in a society rather, meet those three qualifications, defensible, divestible, and definable, then you have a property rights regime that stands muster and is, and is just. But we can talk about justice later too. I don't know if I answered your question. All right. Maybe, maybe see if you can rephrase the question and then we'll come back to um, it. As a corollary, can you def are you familiar with the work of Hernando de Soto? I am. Can you, I think what he's asking for is maybe a little bit more of an explanation on that score. And not at all. That's not what he asked. Well, if someone can rephrase the question uh, a little bit, I, I'm I didn't happy understand to it either. address it. Let's, yes, sir. Thanks for your phone call. Well, yeah, right. Uh, I'm going to actually go in a somewhat different direction than I happy intended. To. Um, in the light of subsequent discussion here. I'm wondering about the extent to which you would call yourself an empiricist in this stuff. And to, to use an example that came up here, Tim referred to the claim that the folks, and I guess it was Indonesia who work 18-hour days, get six times the rate that they would make the rice paddy folks get. Now, all right, and, and I take it that, you know, if, if, if your attitude is, gee, if they're getting six times what the other blokes are getting, then why, what's the big cow about them working 18-hour days when the folks in the paddies are probably working at least eight hours anyway? Some such, all right? Now, but let's suppose that instead of it being a six-to-one ratio, it was, let's say, a six-to-five ratio or a 23-to-22 ratio, if you see what I mean. Is there any point in that digression, if that's the word, from a six to one ratio down to a one to one ratio, or for that matter worse, where you would say, hmm, um, if the one group are getting virtually a pittance more, if that, than the other group is, maybe I should reconsider my presumption that you've got a market, a fair market force type of situation at work, which I can understand why you would have if there was a six to one ratio. You know, one of the key uh, observations of Austrian economics is the subjectivity of economics. So to say, this is a fair price for me, and to ask whether it's a fair price for you, or to say that it's a fair price for you, is two different things. 
I don't know. That's my answer to your question. Because I'm not there. I'm not the one who's choosing to work at a 5 to 6 ratio, or a 21 to 22 ratio, or even at a 6 to 1 ratio. It's up to the person who has, and, that, and that's how a free market works. It's up to the person who's making the economic decision to say whether it's worth it. And that person, by his action or inaction, changes the other prices that are being offered, the other salaries, the other wages, the costs of labor in the future by their decision of whether to participate in that or not. So one of the key values that I appreciate most about libertarianism is the ability to say, I don't know. I don't know what's fair to you because you are the only one who can determine that. What's fair to you today might be different from what you think is going to be fair for you tomorrow. And so it's, this is, again, one of the key observations in Austrian economics is the subjectivity of value. Okay, if I remember. I don't know if I'm cheating you or not. <laughs> is that what you're saying? If I remember right, can I have a follow-up? Okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, if I remember right, I don't when, know. This, when, when, when this came up, I, I, I'm trying to remember the context of which of the dialogue, dialogue you had, maybe it was with, with the gentleman in the back, where Tim had rejected about this. My vague recollection, at least, is that in that dialogue, you did not start out by saying, well, with respect to the 18-hour day shebang, I don't know enough about the situation such that I can comment. I don't know whether you have a free market work at work there or not. And would it have been better, perhaps, for you to have said, I don't know to what extent there's a free market at work there. For all we know, you could have kids being kidnapped from rice farms and held in these other factories with a chain on the door at night when everybody goes to sleep, for all we know. You know, I, I, there are stories that in China there are nets to stop the guys from jumping out of the windows to commit suicide. Uh, would, would it have been better if you would have qualified your response to begin with along the lines I just described? I did. I said if the, okay. if, if the person chooses voluntarily to do okay. it. And that is that is the key there. Okay. Yeah, and that's exactly how I qualified it. Yes, sir? Uh, kind of a follow-up to what this gentleman was saying. Um, and, and maybe you, you, I don't know, I'll just, I'll just go out and say it. Uh, the, the criticism of the role of government, uh, uh, he, the gentleman is asking you a question, when the ratios are closer, and much more just, whatever that means, uh, maybe there, there's not much of a squabble. We let things as they are, let the marketplace control. But when there's a big disparity, and maybe some harms are being done, are done that offends people, uh, some governmental body should jump in there and stop the free market. So, so, uh, do, 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 does your group have uh, a general criticism towards governmental uh, intrusion in that government? So this was one of the questions that we tackled the other evening. We asked a question, is income inequality unjust? And I think that's pretty much what you're getting at there. The disparity, the gap between the top person who's making a certain amount of money and the bottom person, and that gap keeps getting bigger and bigger. Is that is that the basic no, crux I mean, of what you're looking at? Probably Sounds like it. Not articulating it well. Uh, I'm just uh, if if your position, if the group's position, uh, classical libertarians' position is that the marketplace should basically decide all all questions, except except those things at the extreme margins. No, no where economic questions. Economic questions. Uh, that maybe uh, the blue the blue ribbon panel of experts should step in and intrude on that marketplace on issues that are more controversial. And that blue ribbon, uh, blue ribbon committee is the government. Well, let's, let's do it with income inequality because I think, that's, I, I think that's an application of what you're talking about. And so income inequality, uh, a lot of people like to say, uh, cite statistics from the IRS that say, 275% uh, of the income increase in the past 25 years has been 
uh, collected by the top 1%. That's obviously what uh, the 1% versus 99% polemic is all about. And so you have mass amounts of wealth being generated by the top 1%. The gap between what those people make and what the people in the middle class and, and the working class, the lower class make, is much larger now than it was in 1975. A lot of people are offended by this outcome of the market. Now, what's interesting is this is not a complete market outcome. I was actually looking for someone in our debate the other day to uh, uh, defend uh, or to say that income inequality is unjust, point blank, to say that number matters. What people make at the top versus what people make in the bottom and that difference, that's what matters. But I couldn't find anyone to do that. And so I was on stage with someone who says, no, it doesn't matter, which is my general uh, position as well. But what I told the person is that income inequality matters sometimes. And it matters only sometimes when it was created by government policies, such as crony capitalism, such as subsidies, such as tax favorability, such as the minimum wage, which is another thing that keeps people very poor and out of jobs. Income inequality in that case is unjust because it was created from a system that was not the collective uh, 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 deeds of, of people in the free marketplace. And so in those cases, income inequality is unjust. How can we get people, how can we address that? Is it government that addresses that? How would government know how to address it? Government wouldn't know what the person at the top needs to make versus what the person in the middle needs to make. Would government do a good job addressing it? Probably it probably my question. It, it wouldn't, because think about what they do with the minimum wage. They say there's a certain level under which you shouldn't pay a person. When that happens, you price a lot of people out of the market. A lot of unskilled people whose work is not worth $8 an hour, for example, can no longer find jobs because they can't be hired legally. Therefore, you have unemployment, and you have a certain number of people, and, and, th and those people who are unemployed have a lower income than they would have if they were employed in a seven, uh, six dollar and twenty five cent an hour ten job, cents an hour. or a ten cent an hour job, even if yeah, that's what their yeah. value is. See, they could get them good jobs. So, there, when government addresses these problems, there's something called, and, and Mises talked about this. It's called the calculation problem. How could the Soviet Union have calculated how many widgets they would have produced? at a factory and for how much they could have sold it. Okay. They couldn't. They, they did. They did, but it, wasn't, but it wasn't based on any kind of supply and demand. It wasn't based on how, much, how many widgets they can sell for how much price. It was based entirely on an arbitrary level, similar to the minimum wage, that they chose in a blue ribbon committee and that they said was the appropriate or the right or the just amount that they should sell those widgets for, or should they should uh, pay the people who make the widgets for. It's all the same thing, and it creates income inequalities that wouldn't exist and would be far less unjust if it were living, uh, left up to a free market economy. Um, quick question. Um, the, I, I think what you're trying to get at is the difference between what Adam Smith called mercantilism and capitalism. Can you define those two terms real quick? Well, Adam Smith called mercantilism, uh, it's called corporatism today, and I may have alluded to that before. And corporatism today is when uh, corporations, which you were speaking about earlier, have the ability to influence policy such that they benefit from subsidies, special tax consideration. General Electric doesn't pay any taxes. Uh, they're given special no-bid contracts, like Boeing or Lockheed Martin with the Defense Department. That's corporatism. That's saying that this is an economy that's, that its largest actors, large corporations, are going to be uh, uh, chosen by the actions of a single organization, which is, uh, which is government. Capitalism, on the other hand, it, it doesn't necessarily ex uh, include that element of cronyism. It includes voluntary actions by every member of the economy uh, choosing what to buy and what to sell at prices that are agreeable to them all at any given point in time. And so there is a difference between corporatism, mercantilism, and capitalism. One of the things that people in the free market movement attempt to clarify today is they don't want to call their, the, the uh, economy capitalist. They think that has a bit of a dirty word, a dirty sound to it, um, unfortunately. Uh, so they say free market economy. And so that's as clarifying uh, as we can get with the terminology. Okay. Yes, Charlie. Hopefully I'm not going to uh, rip you off anymore. 
<laughs> All right, Rich, is there a categorical imperative to do right and wrong, or is it okay to engage in some kind of moral calculus every time we look at a situation, kind of like dull, you know, and just, is there, is there an essential right and wrong at the core of the human spirit? I'm not going to answer that tonight for you, Charlie. Ah, come on. I think there is, but there's no way I'm going to prove it. <laughs> uh, I think most people would go along with the notion that exploitation of eight-year-old children is just, it's wrong. Now let's, one of the stakes a little bit, let's uh, look at a somewhat different situation. Do you think it is possible for employers to ex uh, exploit use employees. Do you think it is possible for this situation to exist? And if employees could be exploited, do you think government ever has a role to try and stop this exploitation? I do think that people can be exploited by their bosses, yes. I'm not so sure that government does the best job at addressing those problems. Is it better than not having government address it at all? Um, sometimes, sometimes not. Give me an exact example. Minimum, well not minimum, but uh, overtime. One of the objectives of overtime when it was enacted in the 30s, Fair Labor Standards, was to spread uh, jobs around. If you can have enough uh, work, they can employ people more than 40 hours a week, hire more people instead of making some people work 60 or 80 hours a week. So you have enforcement of overtime. And then you take that to its logical conclusion and you have a situation like in France currently where you're not allowed to work more than 30 hours a week unless you want to go to jail. I mean, that, it, it can be... But well, you have a lot of people that are working now as opposed to some people okay, working. Okay, so... What we have here, we have people working with jobs of three people getting paid for one and then we have other people that are unemployed. That's what we have here. The unemployment is purely a symptom of those very problems, of those very policies. Uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me make sure I understand this right. Please. You're against the minimum wage because it says be, you cannot pay anyone below this X amount because, uh, and you're against it because it, in effect, uh, keeps out a large number of unskilled uh, workers who would not be worth whatever the minimum wage is. Now, carried to its logical conclusion, uh, does this mean that you would favor, if you could get away with it, paying some guy five cents a day uh, simply because of the fact that that's what the market will bear? Uh, are there no are there no bottom levels as to what is intolerable in the treatment of uh, workers? Uh, is there no floor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not an arbitrary I mean, in, floor. in effect, in effect are you, it sounds like you're advocating slavery if you can get away with it. No. There's not an arbitrary floor. It's not a static floor. If, if the person chooses to work with me for five cents an hour and that's what I want to pay him, then that's fair. If he's yeah. better off and I'm better off, then that's fair. Hmm. If that's a voluntary choice that they allow themselves <coughs> to make, perfectly fair. Follow up yeah. question, if I may? Yes, sir. One of the arguments made uh, by the southern slaveholders before the Civil War was that, A, the slaves were better treated uh, and lived under better conditions than the factory workers in the North, which in many cases may have unfortunately been true, and that if the slaves felt so poorly treated, they could always have voted with their feet and left the plantations, as many did. Uh, therefore, are you saying that the same justifications for uh, slavery in the South are the kinds of justifications you could use uh, for an equally egregious kind of wage slavery uh, in this country and the rest of the world? I'm not, and you know I'm not. I don't know if you're not. Yes, you do. The, the difference there is free association. And you know who was enforcing the laws of slavery? The government was. Those were laws that were on the books that allowed people to own other people. And that is not just. And you know who repealed those laws? The government. 
uh, after aided, they had aided by half a first million place. Yes. Uh, soldiers. But who, but who put it in place in the first place? Government put it in place. Government officers enforced the laws. Government officers went to the north to retrieve stolen or property that had fled north. If you didn't have a government that was enforcing slavery, then we wouldn't have the ability to have those people be returned to situations that they didn't want to belong. Are you in slavery on the government? Or I am. the slave owner? Indeed I am. No, he's got a good point. No, the underground oh, railroad is the underground. Oh, Rich, let me <laughs> the guy who owned the slave. Oh, it was the guy who owned the slave. And it was also the government that enforced his unjust property right. Yes, sir. Okay, the government may have had bad policies from time to time, but this day may have bad policies. Is it beyond government to autocorrect, such as appealing slavery? It's not beyond government to autocorrect. No. In fact, one of my previous positions was at a group called Illinois Policy Institute, and we were promoting public policies that would be passed through legislation into law to repeal many of these bad laws that we see in, the, in our state. It's not beyond government to repeal, to uh, correct itself, but you have to look at what government is. It's an organization of people, ambitious people, and when ambitious people are put together, they want to increase their own power. They want to keep their jobs. They want to be loved and to be lovely, as Adam Smith said. And what government does is it expands because that's the purpose of the people who are in it. They'll repeal it if it's in their best interest or they're pressured long enough. It's not beyond government to correct itself, but it's very unlikely that government with the power that it wields through police power is able to do it in a, in a just way. Yes, bro. itself isn't going to do it. It's a republic. It's a republic where the individuals within it, yes, they're, I'm not saying, you know, that's the, we were talking about that earlier. Libertarianism doesn't posit a utopian society. But what it says is that a republic is probably the best means for people in society to participate and to make their thought best articulated into the laws that govern the society and property, as you were talking about. And it requires a lot more than a simple structure. It requires pressure from people. It requires, like Madison said, Madison said actually, when they were forming the early republic, that this, that a larger republic would actually work better than a smaller republic than what they saw in Sparta. Because with a larger republic, you would actually have competing interest groups that would cancel each other out. And that's what we have a lot of the time when you've got all these left-wing think tanks and right-wing think tanks. They all butt ahead and, and nothing ever gets done. And you've got that type of pressure between different interest groups all the time. Your exception to the Soviet 
socialism republic. Was that a real republic? Or was it just called a republic? It was just called a republic. It was a republic in your term a republic. No, it was elected by... Which incorporated the Roman state and the other republics. It was an oligarchical republic, that's right. What we're looking for is a representative democracy. Yes. Um, this is getting good. In the uh, conclusion of Book One of the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith said that uh, all benefits of a society accrue to the landowners. And Henry George put a finer point on that 100 years later in Progress and Poverty. So, if we had all this, if we had a uh, uh, a revamped economic system, you know, free market economics like you're advocating, and everybody had good jobs and the economy's humming along. Uh, our rent would simply you know, would simply go up. Uh, what? It's all relative. What would uh, you know? What would you do? What would be your? Why would what what tax system would you use? And uh, why would that be superior to a single tax on land that yeah. like Henry George advocates? I know I, a lot of my friends are Henry George advocates. They love that single tax, and I'm just not. I'm not on board with that. Oh, I love it. Have you ever done your own taxes yet? I have, all the time. Uh, I'm not on board with that yet. And, you know, to your question of, of everyone prospering, and this, it, it wouldn't be utopian, by the way. Let me just let me just say that right here. But it would be the best of all possible worlds. If we were to have raised rents, then ostensibly what you'd also anticipate is that raised salaries, too. It would be an inflation of, of everything. Um, so I'm not I'm not on board with the single tax. Uh, I, I've read Henry George, talked about it with a lot of other people. I'm yeah, I You're don't thinking know. that salary goes up because rents go up? The rents could only go up because salaries go up. Let's be let's be sure we say well, causation. Yeah, rents do go up because salaries go up. That's exactly why they do. That's because right. Because all benefit, all all productivity increases right. go to the landowner. That's what Henry George was looking at in 1879. Right. Why at that, at that time, the mo why that modern state, why why were people why was there still so much poverty after all the immense productivity gains we had? And it was because all the all the gains went to landlords. The rent just goes up. I mean, there's a reason why the condo right now that I'm uh, house dog sitting for somebody for is probably worth about. Uh, Oh, two hundred and fifty or four hundred thousand uh, dollars, right here on Lakeshore Drive in uh, Addison, versus if it was in Detroit, it would be worth maybe four thousand dollars. That's because there's a lot of good, high-paying jobs here, and the landlords know that people can pay that kind of rent right. to get it, or there's not in Detroit. So that that's the thing. So uh, should we have this? Is it, what's the difference between property in man and property in land? If a uh, if a uh, if some landowner, let's say you have an island and you have 99 slaves, and uh, you get you you extract the fruits of their labor uh, for yourself, you're the master, and then one day you set them free. So guess what? You're all free, but you have to pay me rent, and you know it's the fruits of your labor. It's the same thing. It's, you know you're you're still slavery. Uh, you're still giving the fruits of your labor to somebody else. That's what we call slavery. And without a, without a land tax, that's exactly you're, you're earning money. Then you're giving it to your master. Rip bottles. Rip bottles. Yeah, come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. Let's. Yeah, I'm not. So, a fan. Well, why is your system? Why is your ta What is your tax? What is your ideal tax system? Why is that superior to a, to a land tax? That's what I want to know. Hey, he told me you don't like any George. That doesn't make a difference in each answer to the question. Why is his, what's his ideal tax system, and why is that superior to a single tax on land? Like Henry well, like a property Robinson. tax system would be? Is Not, that what the question Well, is? land tax. There's a difference between land and property. I'm talking about land now. Land but tax. Why, uh, what, what, what's your ideal tax system? We have to fund government. That's so it, uh, Bob. Yeah, I'm not sure, Bob. I'm, we can talk about it later. You don't have a tax system. I don't, don't have an not, ideal not tax system. Not on land. I, I'm just, well, no, on any, what's your ideal tax system? All right, Bob. Uh, it would be on sales. On, 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 it would be on sales? Yes, on buying things. <laughs> and why is that consumption? All right, all right. Okay, we'll defend it. Right. We'll defend it. What's your defense? Defend it. We, I can, I can tell you about that later. It seems like everyone kind of wants to move on. <laughs> yeah. 20 minutes. Defend it.
Okay, are you going to call him, or should I? Uh, all right. Uh, you, know, I... Uh, you mentioned that you quote read Henry George. Could you explain? Did you take a course at the Henry George School, or did you read Progress and Poverty, or did you read a book, a page in a book? How, how did you learn about it? Do you know a gentleman named Rob Ross, by chance? No. He gave me Progress and Poverty a couple of years ago. And you read it. I've skimmed through it. I haven't read it all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jeff. Okay. I'm going to present what to me and maybe to others here is the elephant in the room in this society at this time. And I'll ask you a two-part question pertinent to it. Number one, would you grant the proposition that the American so-called market economy is in decisive respects rigged via such means as corporate personhood and such means as the availability of only certain outfits to borrow from the Fed at a quarter of a percent? Well, the rest of us cannot. Insofar as you grant that there are significant, decisively significant aspects of rigging of this purported free market economy, to what extent do you guys regard the investigation and unraveling of that rigging to be of the highest <coughs> or something approaching the highest priority? Eradicating crony capitalism and corporatism is the highest priority of libertarians in a free market society. Well, for instance, would you agree that there should be something that if we can execute people, should we be able to execute corporations? Well, that would be meaning that would be executing. But the death penalty for a criminal enterprise would be. Uh, you're talking about corporate personhood. Corporations are made of individuals. And individuals don't lose their rights based well, on coming together. Right, let's put it this way Is it possible for a corporation to engage in criminal activity? to such a magnitude that the state would have the right to confiscate all of its assets. assets. That's why corporations were put together in the first place, so that they would protect assets of individuals from Well, from well that. Le leaving aside the limited, I mean, but... No, I'll that is why corporations were established. Well, no, I mean, that doesn't answer the question. A corporation owns a bunch of plant equipment and this and that. Yeah. Would it be possible in principle for all those assets to be confiscated in the event that a jury finds a corporation as a criminal conspiracy? Then you'd have to put every you'd have to put everyone in jail. Any every stock. No, no, I'm owner. talking about the, 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 the stock. Owner. But they but they own the property. They own the property. Well, and what, if they engage in a criminal enterprise, what is supposed to be done? Then? Individuals are the ones who engage in criminal enterprise. You put them in jail. Which, which, which the ones who engage all the stockholders? In, not the stockholders, the people who actually did it, the management, the board, whoever. Put if those, you, all right. If you put the whole board in jail, is there going to be no board to take over to, to continue to run the plant and equipment to continue the criminal? Well, stockholders will elect a new board. Wow. Okay. That's so how it works. The price continues. Okay. Okay. Craig. Wow. Okay. Yeah, a story that happens every single day. A child is born. Poor single mother, single mothers messed up on drugs, child has absolutely no opportunity. Is it fair then when that kid grows up to that he would accept a 50 cent an hour job? Is it fair that people are expendable? You're talking about it. It's fair if somebody voluntarily accepts a 50 cent an hour job. Is it fair if this kid never had any chance to develop his potential? If that's well, that, that is something you know completely different than the current state. If a person has only the opportunity to take a 50 cent hour a job, then that's a tragedy of everything that came before. There's nothing we can do about that now. What we have to do is, is, is treat people from the very beginning, educate them well. And one of the reasons that I advocate school choice is the number one civil rights issue of our time is so that we can do that. The school system in the country is failing us. 50% of people in the Chicago public schools don't graduate from high school, they drop out. Only one in three African Americans who graduate from the Chicago public schools get a college degree by the time they're 23 years old. I mean, that's an absolute failure. That's where you need to address it. Don't address the symptom, address the cause. And how do you do that? You put competition and choice in the school system instead of a single monopoly. Charity schools hey, what, haven't what, done any Charles, what you have a question? Yeah, uh, I, I'm a green guy, and... You look yellow I, 
I've seen the free market do a lot of bad things to the earth, and I but the free markets did that. I, I I lived in West Virginia, and these guys came and blew up mountains and chopped trees down and left rubble and disappeared, and I I haven't seen the free market do anything kind to the earth and respect it. Oh, kind of ruined it. Wherever they want. I mean, you're ruling the earth. You can't stop that system. We're free markets. We're all ruining the earth in that case. What you're talking about is individual actors. And you can talk about, go to the Soviet Union. You can look at some of the mines that they've had in places like Romania, which was in their sphere of influence. <laughs> And the state-owned mines are the ones that are ruining the I environment. Can, it's can. not free markets. Be careful to differentiate between the two. It's bad actors, and bad actors should be punished when they act badly. And that's why we need some regulation in a free market economy. So we need an EPA. Perhaps. Maybe not one that acts without license, without approval from the Congress. But we need, perhaps need some organization that does set standards. Well, and they've done an excellent job in the United States. They've gone far beyond their mandate. But they've done an excellent job of cleaning the air and the water. It's cleaner than it's ever been in the last in the in the 20th century. Mike Foley. <laughs> you you, uh, used, the, you used the phrase a couple of times. I say this is sort of a gotcha question. I know it's sort of a gotcha question. All right. But anyway, you used the phrase a couple of times. Granted rights. People are granted rights, civil rights, economic rights. You know, I'll, I'll just say right now, if I said granted rights, that was, I was misspeaking. That's what People I was are granted rights. People have rights by virtue of being human. Thank you. That's okay. what I was asking, really. Thank you. All right. All right. No, if I said granted rights, that is a, that's a, no, I misspoke. Okay. All right. Okay, you talk about uh, students having choice in schools, and realistically now, if you're the person that this gentleman described, uh, Growing up on the bad side of town, having what choice does a person have? Well, he doesn't have one right now, unless a uh, so he, he can only go to the public school that's assigned to him by zip code, right? So that's where he has to go. The state mandates that he attends that school, and if he doesn't, then he, he's going to be taken away from his parents. Yeah, what on earth is wrong with improving the local school? Nothing is wrong with improving. But why would they improve if they didn't have any other competition? What, for what reason would they improve if they're the only game in town? If someone is forced to go to that institution simply by being down the street or, or a couple blocks away, why would the school improve? When I was going to school, the school I went to was pretty much the only game in town, and I managed to do all right there. And for me, too. Care, and I went to a public school in Atlanta. But not every school is like that. People respond to different incentives. And what you need to provide and what you need to discover is the incentive to drive people to excellent performance. So if we took this kid and put him in Lake Forest High School, you're saying you'd be a lawyer? Sorry, Craig. Okay. I mean, you know, isn't Mr. Scrooge came up with a good system? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses to take care of these disadvantaged people? I'll leave that there. <laughs> you know, earlier you were taking the Ron Paul line of uh, that everything the Federal Reserve is, is wrong and uh, it was a terrible thing that, uh, that they uh, extended uh, credit and the crisis uh, uh, created money. Um, although, uh, your thesis that uh, it must have led to inflation it hasn't actually led to not yet, because they mandate that that money stay in the banks currently, so it's not in circulation. But go ahead. But uh, my question is, so you don't agree that um, any governmental entity, and the Fed is a quasi-governmental entity, the government's not in any way responsible for trying to mitigate the uh, uh, ill effects of the business cycle? The Federal Reserve creates the business cycle. It has a dual mandate currently, and it wasn't always so. It has a mandate to preserve stable prices. Prices increased 3,000% over the, over the life of the Federal Reserve, if you look at the Fed's own data. 3,000%. It also is supposed to, to ensure full employment, natural rate of employment between 4 and 5%. Has it done that? 
the proof is in the pudding. It's certainly not doing that currently. The, the question is, would, would things be worse if there was no government intervention? And it seems quite clear that had there been no government, government intervention in 2008, uh, that probably we would have entered a depression rather than just a large recession. Have you ever heard a term, actually it was initially coined by Nietzsche, and then Marx borrowed it, and then a gentleman named Joseph Schumpeter borrowed it, and it's called creative destruction. Mm -hmm. Is that familiar? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I've heard the term bandy around. But, uh, what is your impression of creative destruction? Well, uh, clearly uh, for someone that uh, wants to um, uh, allow situations to exist where uh, very detrimental effects can occur based on, I mean, obviously in nature you have all sorts of cycles where, I mean, you have, you have cycles that exist where there's, you know, really horrible things happen. You know, there's a volcano, you know, destroys everything around it, and then, oh, that's, that, you can call that creative destruction because, gosh, I mean, after the lava covers everything up and everything's destroyed, right. you know. Let, let me interrupt few, you there. A few so, hundred years later, you have a very beautiful island. Right. So creative <laughs> destruction is this. It's when unproductive resources are put into productive means. And sometimes what that requires is car companies like Chrysler or GM or companies like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers not having the human capital, the, the buildings, the land, the computers, the whatever else, the cash, whatever that they have in reserves, not having that for unproductive purposes that don't create prosperity, value, and profit, but moving that, allowing them to, to liquidate those resources, return it back to the people who loan them and are actually own those resources in the first place, and allow them to use those finite resources on more productive means that they might identify. They might identify an unproductive source, and, and then they have to liquidate again. But what creative destruction is, is repurposing unproductive resources for more productive means, at least in the minds of the, the objective situation of the mind of the person at the moment. So creative destruction is what would have happened if we hadn't had a Federal Reserve to keep those zombie institutions such as banks and car manufacturers alive artificially, raising their price above what people would have paid for it in, in a free market. And now we have organizations that are taking up valuable resources, both human and otherwise, that could be used potentially otherwise in a much more productive fashion. That's a problem, and we've seen America didn't have a central bank of this nature until the 20th century. If we had we were we were fine. It was a fine economy. You had creative destruction happening all the time. Creative destruction can be used as a pejorative, but I tend to look at it as, as a positive. There are opportunities that we can then pursue that we would not be able to do otherwise. Judy. Okay, so you are arguing that we should have let the banks fail because they what basically we did with the bailouts was choose winners and losers. We let Bear Stearns and Lehman go, but we saved Goldman Sachs, who was the biggest criminal enterprise. Well, we let Bear Stearns go, we saved Lehman. Yeah, I can't And now you have a situation with MF Global where investors can't get their money because JP Morgan, unfortunately my bank, um, is saying, no, we get it first because of some provision in the law. What can we do about stuff like this so investors aren't cheated out of their money? Well, there are different classes of stock. You can have A stock, B stock, or C stock. Creditors are uh, defined uh, according to uh, when they got into business or, or what price they paid for that stock. One of the problems that we had in the bailouts, especially with the car companies, is that the preferred stockholders, the preferred creditors, weren't actually given the dispensation that they deserved. And so the, the federal government, when it purchased stock in those companies to, to boost it up, completely ram, just, just completely bulldozed over the other people who were otherwise entitled, like in the very situation that you're talking about. It was government action that bulldoze over the people who were entitled to get a, resources from, uh, from the, that uh, situation. Um, so what can we do about it? We can have government enforce the law. It's a situation like I was talking about to Brom earlier. Defensible, defendable, and definable property rights. They have to be defensible and you have to know what they are in court. The problem here is the, the Congress changed the law to make X JP Morgan, bankruptcy in this case, law. the bankruptcy law, how do we get that changed back because the banks and others are so much more powerful than us? 
a corporate person is more powerful than you and me and all of us together because they have money and lawyers that we don't. How do we change it? How? <laughs> you tell me. We got to change it back because that's that's wrong. Take over the corporations. All we're all corporations. All of us own corporations. Come on, guys. We're all corporations. Oh, <laughs> All right. So under the, under the principles of creative destruction, what you're essentially telling me is that the Soviet Union faced with a quantity of citizens who it felt were unproductive because they were dissidents or whatever, that it had the right to convert their lives into the production, the forest production, of gold and timber resources. Say your question once more. I'm not entirely yes. sure I got it. All right. What you're saying is that under creative destruction, that the Soviet Union had the right to take what it felt was an unprofitable resource, the lives of citizens who were uh, dissidents, send them off to labor camps and convert them and convert their lives into the forced production of gold and timber resources. That's just one example of capitalist creative destruction. And it's not capitalist because it's not done with free market economy. Yeah, that's that's a straw man argument. Uh, I'm not going to deal with that. All right, I'll give a real general one here. Why, why do you, what is the candid opinion of the organized labor movement, Rich? Why do you think it came about? And why did some, what is your feeling that people were wanting to engage in collective bargaining? What, what is, why did I think it came about out of noble uh, thought. I would have supported it had I been around at that time. I still support organized labor. What I think time? free association is great. Um, what I don't support is when uh, organizations of workers have the ability to dictate their, their own pay by electing, essentially, the people who are their bosses in the federal government. And because we are, and because we are basically coerced through taxes, to pay for all of this, we have no choice whether to support it or not. Right. It's special treatment under the law for certain individuals to be able to demand pay, benefits, etc., or else they don't perform the functions of government to which we are all entitled. And that is hostage taking, and that's wrong. Sure. Oh. Yeah, if the corporate barons are able to vote and elect their bought and paid for representatives in Washington, why should not the workers who make the fortunes of the corporate barons possible, why should not the workers also be allowed to try to elect uh, people to represent their interests? Didn't you say in a republic you have, what saves a republic is divergent views clashing together to prevent one person from getting the whole pie? So your question is, if, if corporate corporations are able to buy politicians, why can't individual? Oh, I'm saying, buy I'm, I'm saying, if you, you know, you're saying that it's wrong for members of labor unions to uh, elect uh, their representatives in Washington. If that be the case, why then can't corporate uh, barons uh, elect uh, and, in some cases, pick and choose? Uh, their representatives in Washington. Both are wrong. Okay. So there's no elections? No, no. You, what you do is you don't buy elections, you vote. Both are wrong. Both corporatism and unionized uh, uh, influence over elections. Both are wrong. I don't accept either premise. Hey, Tony Ball. Yes. I appreciate your answers there, but uh, where would our capitalistic system be without military, without military spending? And in Georgia, are you from the Atlanta area? I'm actually from Atlanta, yeah. Okay, Lockheed Martin, where would your economy be without we taxpayers paying for this military spending to sustain jobs in your <coughs> city and your state? I don't know. I don't know where we'd be. I don't support uh, no bid uh, contracts for things like Lockheed. In fact, there's a difference between military spending and defense spending. I, I would cut down dramatically the amount of money that we spend on airplanes and bombers and all the rest. I don't know. I don't know where the economy would be. What about the what about the subsidies the oil industry gets? They get depletion allowances plus. 
we pay for protection. We're talking about the streets of Vermont. Taxpayers sure. are going to keep them open so oil can flow. Sure. <coughs> Is this the way capitalism works? No, it's not. That's the way the system that we have works. It's a corporatist system. That's not the way a free market would work. You don't have that sort of corporate protection in a free market. But they, they work against unions. It's, it's the government. Indiana just passed right to work. Yeah. Right? It's the government and the corporate influence that is destroying unions in this country. Is that a question? No, I mean, I want your comment on this and, and capitalism and its effects on just normal working people. Well, the way in which we have capitalism now might not affect everyone uh, positively. That's not, so I'm critical of capitalism currently. I think it's being uh, pursued incorrectly. I think it's being pursued in an unjust fashion. Just like I was saying, income inequality is unjust sometimes, and it's only unjust when the inequality was created by government policies that enriched those people at the top at the expense of the people at the bottom. Don Paul wants lower the corporate tax rate to around 15 percent and he is against unions now where are the rights of working people uh, and we have to pay the taxes that the corporations are not paying yeah there are trade-offs are you really yeah well, are you for ron paul then? i am for ron paul well that's what he wants he wants a lower uh, corporate tax yeah. rate to pay for a much smaller government. unions he's against unions well labor unions. but what how, how much could a president actually impact that discussion I mean, the president really doesn't. Well, that's what Reagan did. With the Yes, look what he did. What do you mean? With those organized. That's not much of it at all. There's, what do you mean? He just mostly labor done movement. He then all the corporations around the country then <coughs> enacted his policies. But that was maybe through his influence. It wasn't through direct action. And that's government, though. You're referring no, to government. That's, no, that's Whoa. persuasion in a lot of ways. So back to your question. Well, it's okay. a very good question. It actually, it, it's a very good question. That's not capitalism. That's not free markets. That's what we call that, unfortunately. But the way in which government have protected corporations, protects them militarily in a lot of cases, like you're saying, straits of four moves, uh, uh, does help them union bust. That's nothing that government ought to be involved in. Unions ought to be the, the creature of individual workers associating to demand better uh, X, Y, or Z from their bosses. There should not be very... It, it, policy, government policy shouldn't affect that unless there's violence involved, unless there's uh, involuntary uh, uh, payments involved, unless there's some sort of force involved that's violating individual people's rights, namely the right to my body, the fruits of my labor, and, and whatnot. Government ought to have no place in that. Okay. Okay. Just a minute. I am for right to work legislation. So what others yes. have questions? We can talk about that. Uh, Maybe next time. We'll that. Okay, if we accept the notions that corporatism and or mercantilism are ingrained in the fabric of society as we know it, and that much as we'd like to, we're not going to wish these away. If we accept that they're here already, would you justify or accept the justification of unions unless and until we can get rid of corporatism and mercantilism? I accept the existence of unions today. I have absolutely no problem with unions unless they force me to pay for, for something that I disagree with. Okay, no. but, but, I, but what I will say, uh, well, why don't you continue? All right, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, if corporatism and mercantilism can be shown to force their ideals and things that benefit them onto workers, why shouldn't workers have the right to organize to the extent that uh, they have the power that they do to keep uh, people uh, from not working for, uh, for less than union uh, standards. Now be careful to not misinterpret what I said. I said I'm not against private sector unions. I'm for private sector unions. I may disagree with what they do sometimes, but that's not for me to say unless I'm a shareholder in the, co in the company. What I'm against is public sector unions. And when you're talking about corporations, I don't believe you're talking about the government. Now, let me say one other thing. Steve Jobs actually said, Steve Jobs is one of my heroes in a lot of ways, but Steve Jobs said, you know, we look around the world and we say, we wish it was different. And we say, how could we change it? What we need to realize is that the world that we exist in today was created by people not any smarter than we were before, and that we can create a new world, too. Okay, Judy? 
Okay, we have companies in this country that try to restrict the rights of workers to organize. Should they be allowed to do that and be protected while doing that? They shouldn't be uh, protected from preventing people from meeting together and asking for better working conditions or striking. No, they shouldn't. I know it happens. Yeah. I don't think that should. Walmart. If I want to sort of pursue the line of inquiry before, and I'll do it this way. A, and it, I guess to make a two-part question, it is a factual part and then a theoretical part. Insofar as you can imagine that, let's say, an outfit like Goldman Sachs used criminal means, fraudulent means, to acquire much, if not, and maybe a great deal, of its property, of its actual physical infrastructure, among other things, do you consider it legitimate for the government to attempt to claw back those ill-gotten gains that are owned by the company? Is that a legitimate function of government? No, because they're owned by individual shareholders. No, they're not. They're well, well wait. If the, all right, let me put it this way. If the individual shareholders acquiesced in Goldman Sachs conspiracies to defraud investors all around the globe, and thereby build Goldman Sachs skyscrapers with tens of thousands of employees, among other things. You mean to tell me that because the shareholders own it, and because they heard no evil and saw no evil, while the brass went pillaging the planet, that all of the skyscrapers that Goldman gets to build with these ill-gotten gains are nonetheless the darling property of the shareholders that cannot be clawed back? I understand the question. So you said two different things. You said either they acquiesced or they didn't see it. If they acquiesced, then they should be co-defendants. Co and then at that point be up to uh, being uh, imprisoned or having their property seized. If they didn't know what was happening, then no. Well, it's their job to know. Uh, okay. But anyway, okay. All right. Okay. I don't know. Co-defendants. If, if they're guilty in, in stealing or fraud, Rebuttals. then they should be uh, they should be a prisoner or taken away. Yeah. All right, Rich. Yes, Charles. Getting into this income disparity, uh, is, is there poverty of choice or is there poverty of circumstance in the world? In poverty of choice. Do we have too few choices? Is, it, we is have all too poverty, few circumstances? poverty of choice? Or is there poverty of circumstance? It, do we and have should, to, should people, anything Is it possible that people it? have too few circumstances? I don't know if, if maybe too few well, opportunities. Really no, let me tell this. Why would anybody, if they truly had a choice, and getting back to your own statement, why would they choose to work in a sweatshop? I don't understand that. For a little bit of money, if they truly had an option, a choice. But they have limited circumstances. They have a limited horizon. Sure. That's not. So what do you want to give them? Do you want uh, to make them CEO of Goldman? I mean, there's all kinds of people in the world working in bad conditions, and they strike to me this is not their choice. Is it? Ask them. I think you ask them. I think you got to put do you yourself. Like, did you, Charlie? You got to put yourself in their shoes. Would you choose to do this if you could do something else? I got to ask him that. If I could work in a sweatshop or work in an office, if I had that choice, I might work in an office. But that's because I'm qualified to work in an office. I've, you got to ask them. I don't know them. Ask the person who's got who's who's working in the sweatshop. Would you prefer to work here or in the, in the well, rice paddies, nuts. in the rice field? What do you think? What do you think they'd say? Now I can buy six times more food for my family. Um, what do you think they'd say? They're making a rational choice. All right, all right. Just some questions. All right, now maybe Bob Matter has the last question. We're going to go to rebuttals. Okay. Um, would you address uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, you know, oh yeah, small business people, self-employed people? that for deck for eons have been working their tails off. They're, they have no protection. They don't get minimum wage. I was a software developer for years. I wrote uh, stuff and sold it. And uh, 
and I worked on contracts like you know a fixed price where I agreed to write something. I ended up probably making a penny an hour. Those people have nobody uh, fighting for them, do they? I mean, there's no minimum wage law that protects you if you're uh, self-employed. You're working on an invention or something. You might you invest all kinds of time, blood, sweat, and tears in it, right. and then these liberals want to come and tax it all away from you when you become do a you successful. Have a question? Yeah, I want them to address that that fact. That, uh, well, wait a minute. Uh, that, that, that these uh, <coughs> that uh, entrepreneurs don't have all these protections that all these white liberals are uh, okay. complaining about all the time. That's why now remember, Bob, I, I call myself a liberal, so be careful. I'm talking about the small L liberals now, not a capital L liberal like us, but the small L liberals right. like Charlie, who want to tax away uh, you know, all the, all the, uh, you know, the success of, of the people the like cost? Steve Jobs that have become successful, the, but yet these people work all their lives, uh, sometimes for free. Question. Why don't you go out and get a job? <laughs> well, that's the thing, these people, <laughs> you them up? It's these people like Steve Jobs. You want to make a speech, we you have didn't a, want to get a job. and you can be a <laughs> so we have no, uh, so to address, the, address, address uh, entrepreneurs and the fact that they don't have all these protections like these, like these small little liberals are whining about oh, minimum wage why did you and you know, know, working <laughs> conditions and all that. Well, I stayed up, I worked 24 hours. I worked around the clock. Let's get the water there. I agree with Bob. Okay, there we go. Go get a union job. How many people here have remarks to make to the rest of us? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. All right, let's thank our yeah. yeah. He put up with us. Thank you. Standing right for the camera. All right. Look at this. These guys are lighting up already. About four minutes, Brom. <laughs> Maybe three or four. Hey, yeah, somebody might be inspired, but okay. What? Four minutes? All right, four minutes. Free market, 20 Free market, yeah. yeah. No, we got. I'll sell my uh, my my time's for Let's sale. Let's auction the time off. <laughs> yeah, I'll auction the time off. Let's get started, gentlemen. There's an empty mic up there. I'm gonna sell it to a child. There's an empty mic up there. Let's get going. I'll lease my time off. <laughs> no children allowed to revoke. I would remind people when you speak at the microphone, speak directly into it. It's a directional microphone. I want to thank our speakers for giving us a cogent and uh, extensive view of libertarianism as seen by a generation which we really hadn't done much work lately. Um, one of the things that uh, struck me in his presentation was that uh, he said, uh, aside from economic coercion, he was referring to the immigrant who had to work 18 hours a day, uh, that there's no such thing in a case like that of non-economic coercion. You have to work, you have to eat, you have to support children, what have you. You don't have a choice. You must work and you don't have the choice to work other than the 18 hours which is available to you. Um, the speaker's premises are really classified as philosophy, not economics. Uh, in the 19th century, a philosopher wrote a book called the philosophy of poverty. Karl Marx countered that with another book that was called The Poverty of Philosophy. <laughs> um, the libertarian precepts that our speaker outlined are just as valid for a communist revolution in the world as they are for capitalism, whether it be, uh, you know, mercantilism or corporatism, uh, so that if we all want to have communism, there's no reason why we can't have it. That's, that's the nature of our libertarian philosophy. Um, I, I might mention, I guess Charlie's outside smoking right now, but uh, in Europe, public workers uh, get half the salary 
of private air, private sector workers, um, they receive the, um, half of the pension of, 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 of private uh, sector workers, and they must work until they're 65 in order to retire, where private sector workers um, retire at 55 throughout Europe. They're trying to push it up to uh, 56 and 57 now. They won't succeed. Um, the creation of commodities and the instability of currencies are really the causes of the current economic crises that we experience now. Uh, it has very little to do with politics. It has very little to do with ideology. It has a lot to do with overproduction and uh, the instability of, uh, of currencies. And I retire from that position. Again, I'm uh, Dennis Nelson. I'd like to thank uh, Richard for his uh, great presentation. We've been energy environmental activists for going on about 42 years now. I consider myself a progressive populist, politically speaking. Markets are neither good or evil. Markets don't care whether we mitigate uh, climate disruption, we save the whales, we stop uh, toxic mercury and lead pollution, or save old growth forests, but we as people should care. Over the years, I've concluded that you have to understand three things. Number one, that you do have a problem. Number two, what the problem actually is. Number three, how the problem can be solved. If the solution is market-based, that's great. If the solution is regulatory, that's great. If the solution is a combination of market-based incentives and tougher regulations, that's great. I support economic incentives to help companies reduce their toxic chemical pollution at the source. And we need uh, stronger regulations to clean up uh, toxic chemical spills and abandon hazardous waste sites. I've uh, got an article here from uh, this Monday's um, Wall Street Journal. Chevron appeals Ecuador ruling in Amazon case. Richard, one of your bad actors is definitely uh, Chevron. You mentioned bad actors earlier. And again, it comes from uh, Monday, January 23rd. Uh, on January 3rd, an appeals court in Ecuador upheld the $18.1 billion ruling of a lower court uh, uh, against Chevron in February of last year. It holds Chevron responsible for environmental and punitive damages resulting from oil operations in Ecuador. Chevron uh, bought Texaco in 2001, which had operations in Ecuador from 1964 to 1992. Chevron has never had any exploration or production operations in Ecuador directly. On Friday, January 20th, Chevron filed an appeal seeking a review of this judgment. And this is a quote from um, a spokeswoman for, uh, for the plaintiffs, Karen Hinton. Chevron seeks special treatment not afforded any other litigant under Ecuadorian law. Chevron's request that a bond requirement be waived would force the Ecuador appellate court to violate laws protecting the winning side in any litigation from further attempts by the loser to delay the proceedings and cause further harm. Now, even though uh, Chevron didn't buy Texaco until 2001, I, Chevron is still legally uh, liable for the oil pollution in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Chevron is vowed to fight against paying for any cleanup until hell freezes over and then fight it out on the ice. Well, Chevron wants to be cute, so we activists can be cute as well. I got a, a great action alert from Rainforest Action RAN. Using sarcasm, humor, and satire is a good way of getting your point across. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to have some fun at, uh, at Chevron's expense, and I decided to lend a helping hand to them. It says, help Chevron come up with its next absurd excuse not to clean up its mess in Ecuador. What you do is you pick a spokesperson from Chevron, and now this is not serious, folks. This is tongue-in-cheek sarcasm. This is facetious, sarcastic. You come up with the most outrageous things that they're supposed to be saying. One first person I picked was... Uh, the in-house uh, lawyer for Chevron, she went on 60 Minutes and claimed that Trace, my time up? Just finish that. Okay, went on 60 Minutes and claimed that the trace amounts of oil in the makeup on her face 
were no more harmful than the hundreds of toxic waste pits throughout the Ecuadorian Amazon that her company refuses to clean up. So we uh, did the two things. Top says, there is a safe level of toxic pollution, and the solution to pollution is dilution. Both, uh, of course, junk science claims of polluting corporations have been making for years. Uh, I'll do the, the chairman and CEO quickly. He says we should abolish the US EPA, something that was brought up. So what I have him saying is, the US EPA is the enemy of free enterprise, and what's good for Chevron is good for the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm speaking right into the right into this thing now. Uh, thank the uh, speaker. I thought it was a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, let me just say that I think there's a lot more in Henry George than the single tax. So it might help the speaker if he read a whole book by Henry George rather than skimming it or taking a course at the Henry George School. I think that would uh, would be helpful. In community organizing, even though I'm a left winger, uh, I found reasons to talk to a bunch of people that I don't agree with. There are people in Jane Addams Senior Caucus who are Republicans and uh, who, uh, who vote Republican because the Republicans will help Israel. Uh, so if I uh, uh, see fit to get together with those folks, I certainly can speak, talk to people like the speaker. And incidentally, I don't know much about Ron Paul, but the few little things I know about him is that it sounds like his idea about defense is closer to mine than the president. So a lot of times you have to compromise you may not get what you want. The rule of thumb in community organizing is those in power compromise. I've got a little sliver of power, so I do a lot of compromising. Thank you. I would just like to point out that the idea of free markets is a fairy tale. It's impossible to have a market that cannot be, that does not offer advantages to some and exclude others. And it's impossible to have a market that cannot be manipulated. So what you need to do is have to where the people in a democracy have an opportunity to say politically what is right, what is fair, and what is just. more people flying than ever 
I'm sure there's airlines that have gone bankrupt and whatnot during that time, but you know, perhaps maybe it might be a little bit better that a bank is a bank and not an investment house. You know, bring back Glass Siegel and some of the other Depression era laws that kind of regulated some of these things that they were in so that we can get back to a more level playing field on, on these things. You know, a, a savings bank is a savings bank, not an investment institution or a venture capital firm. Therefore, you know, you've got certain things. There are stuff that work and things that don't work. Now, like if you have a large corporation that's polluting the environment, the only way you can really stop them is by, you know, the coercive power of government. And sometimes the only way to really break up a large monopolistic company that's dominating a market, manipulating everything, is through the antitrust laws. And sometimes the only way to get a company to treat its workers better, especially when it has a large market dominating power, is by perhaps a coercive labor union at some point to take management to task. But it all involves an element of competition and countervailing power. And unless you can get those forces into play or into the mix, you're going to have, you know, some kind of institution or some kind of person wanting to rule or dominate. And today, what we have, folks, is not capitalism. It's mercantilism. It's corporatism. And the propensity for a lot of the large investment bankers to make fraud. And with that, their solutions, but it has to be done on an individual basis. Thank you. Hey, I'd, love, I'd like to thank the speaker for the very provocative presentation, very competent presentation. Um, but I did not hear uh, one, one comment made by George Will uh, that has, has penetrated uh, and explained much to me about conservatism, or at least it rang a bell, was that it reflects reality. Whether you agree with that proposition or not, it's sort of meaningful to me. Uh, and the reality is that life is difficult. Uh, and, and when we think about conservatism, at least when I do, and what it may uh, be helpful or dishelpful in a governmental structure, uh, is you know, the concept of incentives and disincentives of individual <coughs> participants as opposed to a pool of participants. I'm thinking maybe like unions, uh, shareholders, or the individual sole proprietor. Uh, and and with, when you think about disincentives, you think about risk. Uh, and to... Uh, And, you know, the allocation, the best and most efficient allocation of resources within that system. Uh, uh, obviously, it's very complicated. Uh, and, but uh, if conservatism means that each individual, you know, get in the marketplace, do what you got to do to make a living, get through life, invest your retirement fund, uh, you're, you're frankly on your own. Don't look for government or look for a minimal role in government. And, uh, and segueing away, uh, you know, we, we see the problems of the, the marketplace uh, through the corporate cronyism that was brought up before. But also we know that, you know, labor groups, they also have similar problems at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, so the goal should be that the marketplace must be fair and the system uh, uh, that I think conservatives and these economists on the conservative side are aiming for is that uh, as fair as humanly possible, whether it's metaphysically reachable or not, uh, that's another question, but as close to that extreme as possible. Um, uh, there was, there was uh, uh, opinions raised that I think go to more uh, opportunity, uh, access to opportunity. Maybe you were born with, with a bad hand. Fate struck you a bad deal. You're in one of these countries that don't have an economy, and you're going to be stuck making that 50 cents an hour job. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what do the rest of us do about that on this planet? 
Uh, I, I guess our role would be let's all reduce our all income so we can help that stranger in the Philippines have a, a decent living. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if these, these questions can ever be resolved uh, on Earth. Maybe there's another place we can resolve them. Uh, uh, and and uh, also, one, one other thing that I was hoping I could raise with the speaker was uh, uh, this disincentive slash incentive system. Uh, it, it maybe he could have compared and contrasted that uh, with private sector participants as opposed to governmental participants. Um, and that leads me to another thought. Uh, you know, we heard one of the speakers mention something about private sector uh, had a, they have retirements vested at 55 uh, years in Europe or whatever figure it was. Um, and uh, public sectors at 65. Uh, who pays for that? Uh, obviously, uh, these, this system, these systems seem to me, uh, I mean, they sound great. We all hope we can invest in our retirements at 55, but we don't have to work. But someone's got to pay for that. that were made about slavery. Now it is true that the U.S. government was charged under the Constitution at one point with helping slave old, slave old, with defending slavery and with helping slaveholders get back their property if the slaves ran away. But to blame the U.S. government alone for this is ridiculous. The, it was the people of the South, the slave-owning South, that insisted on this and that demanded that that be in the Constitution. And if anyone, including U.S. Marshals and so on, were less than, um, uh, less than stalwart in defending those provisions, the Southerners spoke up very loudly and very angrily to demand their, the full-fledged and wholehearted enforcement of these laws. And so to let Southerners off the hook here for this is ridiculous. Yes, I also know that there was slavery in the North at the time that, that the Constitution was originally adopted, but it soon faded away. And only in the South did it continue. Second, with regard to airline deregulation, I thought at the time, I still think that it was a mistake. Uh, the services, yes, fares have gotten cheaper, more people fly, and the service has gone right straight to hell. And two, it hastened the demise of the bus industry. A much broader cross-section of the public traveled by inner city bus until the adoption of airline deregulation, and those people flocked uh, to, those people then flocked uh, to the airlines and as a result, uh, you have not only the poorest people, or else bus fans like me traveling by bus. Thank you. Travis all traveling by bus. Okay. Yeah. Got me all set for him? High speed rail. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Before I uh, start talking about the topic tonight, I just want to give you a quick update on. Uh, Jennifer Alquist in uh, Rhode Island. She's the 16-year-old atheist that is uh, fighting to get the uh, school prayer banner taken down uh, out of school, out of West Cranston High School. Uh, she has uh, $36,000 in her uh, scholarship fund now over on uh, the Friendly Atheist website. You can go over there and make a donation. Uh, plus she won... Uh, they set up a special uh, Atheists in Foxholes scholarship at, at the uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation, and they awarded her, made her the first recipient of an additional $10,000. So she's already got herself 46000 in scholarship money. Yeah, and uh, I want to make a point. I've been reading some of the uh, comments on Twitter and, and the Huffington Post about this this thing, and all these. The, the, the Christian Taliban is... Uh, yeah. You know, still threatening her and uh, coming up with all these criticisms of her, and they're all saying, "Well, 
Well, it should be okay to have that school prayer hang in there because the Congress opens it, uh, you know, with a prayer every day. Well, here's the difference. A school prayer hanging in a public institution, for one thing, just the display of that, it becomes a de facto endorsement of religion. And it's not so much that it's a particular religion. It happens to say Our Heavenly Father, which is a Christian thing, and it ends with Amen. So that is Christian. So, But the thing is, the fact is that it's, it's religion. The fact that it even says Our Heavenly Father grant us you know, all these things, well, that's implying that there's a deity that exists and all that stuff. And that's the, the, the problem, is that it's... You know, it's endorsing religion essentially. And here's the thing: when it's in a school, there's a difference between the school and Congress. And the fact is that in school, in school, this is hanging up in front of impressionable minors. These are children, and they're impressionable, and their attendance is mandatory in school. But a Congress of the United States, or a lot of state house chambers, that is a voluntary assembly of adults. And, not only is it a voluntary assembly of adults, the adults assembled have influence over the actions of the state in that situation. In a school, the students don't really have, you know, they're under the influence of the state. They don't have, they don't have influence over the laws, but the Congress does. So that's, that's the distinction. So that's why, you know, it's more pernicious to have the school dis uh, prayer banner display than, for instance, opening up Congress with a prayer. Now, I hate that opening up Congress with a prayer. I hate the in God we trust on money. You know, that's all got to go to. Okay, now, they are great, great to have you here tonight. Uh, you'll find that most Georgians agree with most of the stuff you say. I mean, we're all for free markets. We're all, we are capital L liberals. Uh, however, though, you need to really look at the, at the influence that the land has on things is so significant. And that's really where we need to tax. And if you tax products, oh boy, well first of all, it's a big headache to do that. It, taxes need to be simple to collect. And it needs to be transparent. And if you start taxing up products, you're going to have all kinds of black mat markets and things off the books and guys selling refrigerators off the back of trucks and alleys and things like that. Happening now. And the other thing is that taxing products, taxing goods, uh, will reduce the demand for them. And we don't want that. We want a demand. We want people to be able to buy things and create demand and uh, so we have lots of employment. So what we, what we need to do is, is tax the land. And that will get land that's being held off the market synthetically for speculation purposes. We'll get that land back on the market so labor and capital can come together and uh, create jobs and wealth. after a fashion go in the order of my line of, my lines of questioning to you. Um, the first was about empiricism in the discussion and analysis of this stuff. And, you know, there's been all sorts of statements tonight about what supposedly capitalism can do and did do and didn't do and all that. Yeah. My sense of the history of this place is that at the time of the revolution there was four million people here, some such. Over the next less than 100 years, that grew to 25 million. Over the next 100 years, roughly, it grew to 185 million. I don't know of many societies that managed to grow population-wise at anything like that rate, and, oh, by the way, improve the standard of living of a population growing uh -huh. at that rate. Uh -huh. So it seems likely to me that the Founding Fathers did some things pretty doggone right even if they weren't perfect. The trouble is that in these past few decades or so, there has been, what seems to me and not only me, a decisive set of changes. Markets in this country which were for the most part free and unrigged have become arguably, for the most part, rigged. And that, folks, makes all the difference in the world. Now, 30-some years ago, I was ringing doorbells for Ed Clark. So I am in broad outline on the, on the page that you guys are on, largely for the reasons I just gave. 
But what has to be faced is the extent to which the situation has changed. And and we have to the, the thought has to be given to alternative means of trying to get back control of the situation. As it stands, insofar as the big boys and the big outfits on Wall Street are prosecuted at all, it is invariably with a fine, which for them is the equivalent of a parking ticket, size money-wise, all right? So it's just chump change. Until you claw back the empires that have been built with the stolen money, you're just spitting in the ocean in terms of what's actually happening. And I, I'm incredulous to hear you advocate <coughs> the stockholders, if I understood you right, that the stockholders be prosecuted. I don't know if Goldman has 5,000 stockholders or 50,000 or 500,000. I'm not advocating putting the stockholders in jail. The stockholders in this country are chumps. Here's, <laughs> as I understand it, here's how it works. The board of directors, those guys, the bunch of them, uh, have a shitload of shares. And then management in and of itself, in many cases, has a shitload of shares. And you put those two groups of shares together, you've got an effective plurality. The rest of the stockholders are asswipe. They count for nothing. They see no evil, hear no evil, and know no evil. And so, the, 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 I don't, if they end up losing what little eensy beensy fraction that they own of Goldman Sachs skyscraper, well, two bad guys, you should have been mining the store, or you, deserve, you should have voted with your feet. <laughs> the evidence was there for you to find out. If you didn't find out and find it out, that's life. These empires have to be destroyed. And the proceeds that they acquired through systematic fraud have to be, if not refunded to the victims insofar as it's possible to determine who the victims were, well, then they might as well just be expropriated by the state and put up for auction and maybe then... In, we can do some. We can reduce the national debt or whatever with the proceeds um, from these sales. I don't see any other way that you're going to make any substantial dent into what's happening, other than to have death penalties for corporations for criminal enterprises. Um, I got to say, our speaker tonight was extremely engrossing. Extremely provocative. I disagreed with 90% of what he said, uh, but I have to say he said it well. Uh, Atlanta, very beautiful city. I had, I understand, some relatives who did creative destruction there in the fall of 1864. <laughs> it, gave, it gave Atlanta an opportunity for a new beginning. <laughs> <laughs> the emblem is the phoenix. <laughs> well, we made it possible. <laughs> Government made it possible. Uh, I was a little bit alarmed when I heard you talking about, you know, the elimination of the minimum wage because it would shut out of the labor market those people whose abilities and market abilities were such that they couldn't get jobs and so that therefore we had to completely lower the bar so that if necessary we're paying people a pittance uh, but everyone would work. I have a suggestion. How about raising the skills and the educations of the people who currently cannot get jobs? We have all kinds of government training programs a good number of which are virtually useless and obsolete at this point. But that doesn't negate the value of training programs. We've got, what, 8%, and that's probably a low figure, unemployed in this country. What would be wrong with government doing it? Taking a leaf from FDR, setting up retraining programs. So you made widgets in your previous job. Widgets aren't being uh, sold much anymore, so why not something in the electronics industry? Why not something in computers? There are endless opportunities to retrain people. <coughs> Paralegals. Paralegals, some of them make 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars a year. I know of three people <laughs> that were unemployed for a long period of time 
went into training as paralegals, and they at least have a living wage now. They may not be making eighty thousand dollars. That that may not be true anymore. I grant you, but you get my point. There has to be an opportunity for retraining, reinvention. Now, as far as the classic battle between capital and labor and government, I've long envisioned a kind of a tripod, government, capital, and labor. If one or more of those pieces of the tripod are missing, you have a dysfunctional society. The three have got to learn to work together, not for any altruistic reasons, but for reasons of survival. <laughs> What this country has gone through in the last five or six years has been a nightmare that should never have happened. What we have seen has been government shirking its duties. What we have seen has been labor laying down on the job in many cases. And what we have seen has been capitalist greed run to the nth degree. A pox on all three houses. It's time, if we want to survive as a society, we are going to have to sit down, have a no bullshit come to Jesus conference on how we are going to continue surviving as a country. Or maybe we should prepare uh, to uh, go into third world status. This is no joke. We are at a crossroads. We have uh, some of the smartest men in the country in Washington scratching their heads. Whether they're admitting it or not, they don't know what the hell to do about the situation, but something has got to be done. We have the euro about ready to collapse. We have countries which used to have relatively stable governments, relatively strong economies, tottering, teetering. Um, what we have in store for us, I'm afraid, is international worldwide collapse unless we use our brains. Now, our speaker pointed out that our predecessors were no smarter and no dumber than any of us today. Our predecessors did many wonderful things in the period right after the Depression. We have got to use that same kind of creativity again. Not creative destruction, but creative construction. And it's time that we, perhaps we put some of our prejudices aside, sit down at a table, and realize that we're all in this together. Let's not make it the Titanic. What I hear in the debates is that the strategies that are promoted or being promoted are assuming that we're in a world uh, where uh, that Rawls talked about, where we're at the original situation, we're all blindfolded, this is the beginning of time and we're all free to contract, and blinded, not knowing whether it would be I that affected or someone else affected, we just instantly make these rules. And, and assuming that we're all free to do so. However, the fact is we're not, and maybe there never was a situation, an original situation, we're all free to make contracts. But the danger is that in the campaign rhetoric, we're uh, <coughs> told to uh, assume actions that, as though we were free, when actually there's only a few actors, there's only a few agents that are, can actually be free and would be the beneficiary of this illusion that's being promoted by the campaigners. Thank you. Well, you guys are looking at an illusion here. Anyhow, let's thank our speaker once again. <laughs> We're just getting cooking on this. I'll be eclectic as usual. I don't have a lot to say here. I guess I'm on the other side of the equation here. Uh, I just wanted to correct one thing, Jeff. Um, before we started tributing what the Founding Fathers did right, 
I, I don't know, regardless of whatever our founding fathers did, this country had an enormous amount of natural resources. There's all sorts of variables. And I Others think, had a lot of resources. Yeah, I, we also had an immigrant population that we refreshed every couple of years to exploit to make us all they this came wonderful here, riches they here. here. Once we ran out of bringing people here, it got a little crowded, so we said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll invent something called a multinational corporation. And then we don't have to bring the immigrants here. We can bring our factories over there. I ran into my friend today and said, why don't they put factories on ships so that they could just sail it around the third world countries, you know? And then send back the stuff to us, right? You know, Charlie, that's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea, Charlie. Hey, let me get some going here. That's your capital, right, you know? I'm switch to another day. Sir, and you, Henry George, pal, all you guys, all this economics is bankrupt because there's no element of ethics in it. I'm sorry if I come from that philosophical background, but I'm sorry, there's a right and a wrong, there's a categorical yes. imperative. And human relationships are not callous cash transactions. We all live in communities. I have a relationship with everyone in this room and in this nation. And that's not a relationship based on exploitation. They don't know you And are. what they can pay, yes. We owe things to each other, sir. That's where we begin. Not by what can I purchase. I'm only getting... Now, if there's a glaring inequalities, do something about that. Take from the rich. Give to the poor. You can't disregard it and say, well, that's the way it should be. In the Greco-Roman tradition, I was just reading about it, we... And it amazes me. Americans always vote on things. Where did this come from? It's because in Athens, they invented something called democracy. Now, what do they mean by that? They meant that all men were equal. And that's given greater refinement. We come here in 2012, and we're so far from equality, it's ridiculous. 1% of the people have 99% of the wealth. That's absurd. That is so far from our heritage and tradition that it demands that we do something about it. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to hear some abstract arguments of some economists to try to justify the fact that a rich, that poor people do not have options and choices. They have none whatsoever. That's why they work in sweatshops. That's why they're willing to take jobs they don't like. That's why they tolerate working for assholes. You know, honestly, that's the grief that people put up with. Because they want to provide for their own. Now, the rich guy and the poor man both want to provide for their own and should do so with dignity. Your system does not allow that. And there's no provision for it whatsoever. Now, I will switch. I'm starting a railroad. Am I going to build it regardless of the environment? and say, oh, we need a railroad. Who cares if there's some mountains and forests or little animals living there? We're just going to build it. Or maybe we should have children build it. Or maybe we should get build it at people at a dollar an hour. Because I can find some, some play, yeah. Hey, it's better than a farm, isn't it? I'll have this thing with you guys. I'll have this built in about half an hour. We can get it. Anyhow, thanks for that. <laughs> some good investment capital for Goldman Sachs. We create the model called the Credit Bimelier. <laughs> yeah, I'm no. with you guys. I want my railroad. <laughs> Give me some kids. <laughs> uh, we'll eliminate the capitalist class in the system. Uh, obviously, there have to be some, some way of saying that the means of production that we depend on are administered or determined uh, uh, 
the conduct of the workplace is determined, and probably the best people to do that are the people who are uh, operating those means of production. Uh, they can uh, do it collectively uh, in uh, some sort of a democratic fashion. There are cooperatives, uh, productive cooperatives. Uh, the, the Mondragon uh, experiment uh, has been a very successful one. Uh, what, but making society more democratic uh, means uh, eliminating something of the kind of market system, the crony market system, by the way, uh, I, I would suggest uh, that you, uh, when we talk about the, the uh, government, uh, uh, Peter Schweitzer's book, Throw Them All Out, uh, is, uh, I think, something that all you uh, uh, Democrats uh, ought to read. Uh, of course, he's more or less of a Republican. Uh, he's very critical of uh, those in Congress, uh, both Democrats and Republicans. But he said, you know, crony capitalism is uh, what our uh, state capitalism is like. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it gets a, a little bit of uh, reportage on uh, what the, uh, our, our actual system is. Uh, it's not the uh, idealism of, of uh, the economists of the uh, 19th century. It's not a free market. It never has been a really free market. And uh, the making of the market free would also be making it more responsible, I believe. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the assumption of uh, the rights of ownership uh, by uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, whatever is defensible, you know, and anything is uh, defensible. Uh, if you've got the guns, uh, the courts, uh, the laws uh, to defend it, uh, it, it, it definable and divestible. Yeah, divestible, you, you can liquidate uh, capital, uh, but uh, are you going to liquidate yourself when you're doing it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I want to tell you a little story about what happened to me this week and how the free market has benefited me personally. Oh. You know, I bought a Scion XB. It has a defective part on it. It's called a rear door latch. I went to open it the other day, and the dang thing just broke right off. And I'm trying to figure out what happened. Gorilla Blue didn't work. Some of the other definite things didn't work, but you don't expect a latch to break off the back of a door on a car in less than four years. Well, I figured the first thing I would did was I went to Google, which is probably all you know, the greatest data aggregator device in the world. I just put in the keywords, Scion rear latch problem, and there it was. Forums of a lot of people similarly having different problems. I found Tons of stuff on the Toyota website regarding this very same discussion through engineering problems, and they said it was a defect, but not available for recall. Then I looked at the little thing on the site. It said, scionpro.com. Have a rear latch problem? I've got a better product that you can replace it with. I decided to call the guy, because his 800 number was right there. And boy, he said to me, 
Do the other parts? $110, mine's $95, and it's about 20% more plastic and a lot better for the car, and I've been selling them like hotcakes. I quit my job at the dealership to get this business off the ground, and he's got parts galore. Sure, the solution's not pretty. i got to spend a little money to fix a stinking door latch, but I'll tell you, I was able to find that door latch quick, quicker, better, and cheaper within about a simple 30 minutes of research. So if you tell me that the free market doesn't work, it does. Thank you. Who made that door latch? Next time, come back. Did you ask him who made it? He engineered the part himself. He engineered the part himself. The, the I better. asked what I asked. Who made the damn door latch? Chinese labor problem. Huh? Evidently he did. Huh? You get the last word. Speaker gets the last word. You get the rebut the rebutters. I found out my this week my computer was was made under unsafe conditions. <laughs> serious. Foxconn in China. The guys were dying. Well, I want to thank you all first for your gracious hospitality. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed speaking with all of you and taking all of your questions and the invitation. Look forward to coming up and, and talking with you guys again. It was it was definitely a lot of fun. I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, Robert? Dennis. Dennis. Right on. Perfect libertarian defense of, of uh, environmental policy. I couldn't have said it any better myself. Everything you said I agreed with. Um, I agreed with what the gentleman who said he canvassed for uh, Ed Clark said. Uh, it has changed a lot in the past 30 or 40 years. It has become a lot more uh, interfered with. Uh, the economy, I mean. The more uh, intervention that a government makes in the economy, the more opportunities for cronyism will exist. Period. End of story. The more intervention you have, the more opportunities for, for graft, for treatment, for any of these other things that we all say we disagree with, it opens the door wide open. And I will say one other thing about ethics. The free market is probably the best tool for ethics, for increasing the, no the amount of ethics between large numbers of people that has ever existed. I mentioned this book before, Bourgeois Dignity, by Deirdre McCloskey. She is an economic historian from UIC. And she talks about going out one day at 6 in the morning with her dog, walking her dog outside, and walking by fruit stands that are being put up in a marketplace on Printer's Row. And she says good morning to one of the people with the apple stand. The person says good morning to her, and they start having a conversation about the weather. Deidre walks away. A couple hours later, she returns after walking her dog and comes back and buys an apple. She says thank you to the person who, gave her the, who sold her the apple. The person says thank you back. We interact with so many other people beyond which, beyond whom we would interact with ever before in our lives through the free market. The free market is a great tool for distributing morality, ethics, and all sorts of other values without force and voluntarily through persuasion. Um, my last comment would be to uh, the gentleman here. I, I don't know if I know your name. Uh, Pat Butler. Pat. You said we need a conference? Free market is that conference, man. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, free market. Very good. We need a conference, a free market. I get to interact with children. <laughs>